This is a production of Cornell University. So in this presentation, we're going to go over four things. We're going to go over very briefly, what is a weed? Why bother with weed ID? Some weed ID basics, so some botanical terminology that will be useful for you to know and that I will use some of this terminology in a later section of the presentation. And also this terminology is often in field guides and other books that are useful resources, um, some important weeds in tomato production, and then end it off with some resources that um, can be, that will probably be useful for you to have in your operation. So to start, let's talk about what is a weed. So a weed simply is a plant out of place. I, part, I sort of joke with people that one of the reasons why I chose weed science is I'll always have a job because as long as there's humans, there will be weeds. So it can be, it's a plan out of place and that can be out of place in time. So an example of that is, let's say you planted uh, beans in your field last year and this year you planted tomatoes. If a bean plant came up in your tomato field, you would probably consider that bean plant a weed versus it can be a, a plant out of place in space. So it can be out of place spatially. So in this picture, you see the grass that encroached into the gravel pavement, um, the paving, or it could be a uh, prostrate knotweed that goes into your tomato field or whatever. So it's just a plant that is out of place. And the next thing I want you to think about is which you already, many of you have already answered that poll question, um, is why, why should we, why bother with weed identification? Why is weed identification important? This is something I want you to think about throughout this whole uh, workshop, throughout this present, this section of the workshop. Um, I think if we, if we can bring that poll back up and just show, I think everyone has already answered that question. So we can just look at that, perfect. So we see, Yes, exactly. You, we, no one answered. I don't think I should even bother with this, which is lovely to hear. Um, it's interesting to know the information. I'm happy to see that as well. You like to know if something's a native species. And the big one that was very popular was it allows you to tailor your management decisions. And that is, that is really important to to weed identification and also weed management. So weed ID or weed identification is simply the process of identifying weeds, pretty simple. Um, and you might wonder, well, why bother with it? And y'all have already identified that. It allows you to know thy enemy, not to imply that weeds are an enemy, but by fully, by understanding a weed's biology, so it's life cycle, it's reproduction, it's growth habit, all these things, it allows you to better select um, appropriate control methods. Um, and also make the decision of, do you need to control this? So on the left side of your screen, you should be able to see, hopefully you can see my, my mouse. On the left side, that's Virginia creeper. On the right, that's poison ivy. If you brush against Virginia creeper, nothing's gonna happen. If you brush against poison ivy, there's a good chance you're gonna get a rash. So weed identification is sort of, I like to think of it as the first step in, in management. Before you can manage your problem, your weed problem or your weed circumstances, however you want to talk about it, you need to be able to ID the weed. So weed identification, I like to think of it as the foundation for weed management and control. It is the door that allows you to enter into the management technique spaces. So next we're going to go through some botanical terminology basics. So this is in no way an exhaustive list of botanical terms, rather they're terms that you should be uh, familiar with and have a grasp on. Um, there are terms that will come up in this presentation, again, in um, some examples of weeds that are important in tomato crops, but you'll also see it in field guides and uh, in other resources that may be helpful to you. Don't worry about memorizing these. And if you, if there's a new term that you're not particularly familiar with, don't worry about like, oh, I really have to just get this in my head now. Um, a PDF with what I like to call my weed ID cheat sheet, it's a terminology cheat sheet, will be sent out to you later. So another reason to fill out that DEC uh, poll. 
So the first thing we're going to start with is talking about life forms, specifically monocots versus dicots. But before we can make the talk about the designation between these two life forms, we have to go over what is a cotyledon. So a cotyledon, this is a cotyledon here um, on your picture. It's an embryonic leaf in seed bearing plants uh, where they have one or more of them, which are the first leaves to appear from a germinating seed. So the two main groups, as I alluded to before, are monocots and dicots. Monocots are flowering plants that are characterized by seedlings with one cotyledon. Their leaves have parallel veins and their flower parts are typically in multiples of threes. So think grasses in other grass-like uh, plants like lilies, for example, versus dicots, they're also referred to as broadleaf weeds. Those are flowering plants that are characterized by seedlings with two cotyledons, as you can see here, if you've ever planted beans and you see those two very succulent leaf looking things come out, those are your cotyledons. Um, not, they're not technically the true leaves. Um, the true leaves typically have branch venation, so branch veins, and then their flower parts are in um, multiples of fours and fives typically. The next thing we're going to talk about is life cycle. And to do that, we're going to start with annuals. There are two main groups of summer annuals and winter annuals, but the thing that ties them together is that they both complete their life cycle in one year or less. So starting with summer annuals, that's a plant that completes its life cycle in one growing season. So some common examples of that going from the most left picture to the middle to the center of large crabgrass. You've probably seen this a lot in tomato fields, lamb's quarters uh, and Powell amaranth, as opposed to a winter annual, which pretty much typically survives six to nine months. And what it does is it germinates its seed in the fall or winter, then it overwinters and survives through the winter um, a lot of times under snow cover, but not necessarily needed. And then in the following growing season, it sets seed and then it dies. So the two examples we have here are shepherd's purse and then also common chickweed. The next life cycle we're going to talk about are biennials. So that's a plant that requires two years to complete its life cycle. So starting from left, going from left to right, in the first growing season, the seed germinates and only produces vegetative structures, typically a rosette. So in this picture, this is a picture of bull thistle um, in that rosette, that sort of round, uh, grouping of leaves is typical of a rosette. And then in the following year, after a period after uh, vernalization, which vernalization means a cold period required for flowering, the plant flowers, it sets seed, and then it dies. So on the right, we can see that's a picture of wild carrot, of a wild carrot umbel or the flower clusters. Um, and that is typical of the second year of growth. And then in the middle, that's yellow rocket. Um, that is a, another common biennial weed. Uh, brassicas, for example, are often biennials, at least brassica weeds. And the final life cycle we're gonna speak about today are perennials. So perennials are plants that survive more than two years. And there's two main groups, simple perennials and vegetative perennials. So starting with simple perennials, they reproduce naturally only from seeds. Um, but in a normally do not reproduce vegetatively. So they can have different root cysts, like root structures. For example, the one on the left, uh, broadleaf plantain, it is a simple perennial that has a fibrous root system. If you pull it up, you're not gonna really see a tap root as opposed to dandelions, which I have a feeling everyone here is familiar with and has tried pulling up a dandelion before. They have a pretty serious tap root. The other group of perennials are vegetative perennials, also called creeping perennials. So they can reproduce through seed, but they can also reproduce through vegetative means. So that also means that after you destroy the top growth, they can also regrow from underground organs and spread. Um, an example of that is Canada thistle. So this is a, a picture of a Canada thistle rosette on the left. And then this is it after once it's shot up a shoot and it's flowered. Um, it's really important to know what a biennial is versus a perennial, especially for management decisions. 
one uh, a management decision that works best for biennials might not be the most effective one for perennials. So for example, you see here, this is Canada thistle. If I go back to the previous slide, this is bull thistle. Bull thistle is a biennial. Canada thistle is a perennial. They look pretty similar to each other. The next thing we're going to talk about is growth habits. So there's different growth habits, but we're gonna focus on five here. Starting with upright, which are plants that grow mostly upright. They're also, you might see them referred to as erect in field guides. There's clumping, which are plants that have a mound-like habit and tend to be equally wide as they are tall. They're spreading plants. They also might be called prostrate plants, and they have a sort of horizontal spreading growth habit. There's vines, which climb requires um, structure, especially once they get older, to support, though they might be self-supportive initially. And they climb things, other plants, they climb fence posts. Poison ivy would be a really good example of a vining plant. And then there's rosettes, which um, are roughly circular clusters of leaves that remain close to the ground surface. Um, the final section on botanical terminology that we're gonna go over today is, rela are, is related to reproduction. So the one thing I wanna say before I talk about the different structures is that plant parts are totipotent. So what I mean by that is that they have the ability to grow, divide and differentiate into an entire plant from a plant part. So if you've seen uh, when people take leaf cuttings and they put it in water and then they grow a whole plant from that, that is, that is an example of that. And so the main reproductive structures I'm going to talk about today are seeds, stolons, rhizomes, and tubers. I'm not going to talk so much about what a seed is. I think everyone here has a good understanding of what, what is a seed, what it does. Um, so starting with stolons, that is the second picture from the left. Um, stolon. They are a modified stem that runs above ground and they can reproduce another plant from it. So as you can see in this photo, this yellowish white part that's pointed out with the arrow, these are the stolons. As opposed to rhizomes, which are also a modified stem, but as opposed to running above ground, they run underground and can produce other, another plant from it. So this is a picture of quack grass right here. And these white, whitish yellow root looking things are technically not roots, they are actually stems. And if you cut a piece of this and it gets in another part of your field, it might grow another quack grass plant. And then finally, tubers, which is another modified stem. Um, you see this in a uh, yellow uh, nut sedge and it's thickened and um, can grow a new plant um, in overwinter. So that's pretty much just a recap of terminology. You again, you don't need to have everything memorized. A cheat sheet will be provided to you. And these terms will come up again in this presentation. So you should at least be aware of them. And then as you learn more, you have a very good grasp of it, of life form terms, life cycle terms, growth habit terms, and reproduction terms. So. Now we're going to switch gears in this presentation, and we're going to talk about examples of important weeds in tomato production in New York. I'm going to go through five broadleaf weeds and one monocot that you've probably seen in your fields um, and tell you about a little bit about the biology and then some good ways of being able to tell this apart from other plants that may look similar to it. So to start, we are going to go alphabetically, and we're going to start with common ragweed. Common ragweed, uh, Ambrosia artemisifolia, it is in the aster family, so that's the same family as sunflowers. It is a summer annual broadleaf. See, the terms have already come up. It's an upright plant that has a branch. It's branched, and it has alternate leaves, so I'm going to explain further as I go forward, and the leaves are deeply lobed, so they're sort of fern like they're fine. It has a germination period of May to June generally, and it can flower all the way from August to October, and this plant typically grows to about one to three feet in height when mature. One fun fact about common ragweed is that a lot of people, if you get 
spring allergies or get hay fever. A lot of people blame goldenrod. Well, actually, common ragweed tends to be responsible for a lot of hay fever as opposed to goldenrod, unless you're like my mother and you are allergic to both. If, that, if so, I'm sorry. So some key characteristics about common ragweed, we're gonna talk about the seedling stage. It has round to oval cotyledons. And then the first true leaves are pretty, pretty well dissected. They have these very deep leaf margins. And that's pretty um, special about common ragweed seedlings. You have these round to oval cotyledons and then these very deeply cleft leaf margins. The young leaves are opposite. So that means that they are right across from each other. But as the plant matures, they become alternate and the leaves are hairy on the upper and lower surfaces. If you can, if you're seeing, looking at the photo, you can see some of those hairs coming off the stems and the leaves. So the big thing about common ragweed is it has very deeply cleft leaf margins. In margins, I mean edges of leaves. For the mature plant, it has a shrubby appearance. Um, the stems are densely covered with rough hairs and the leaves are mostly alternate, as you can see here. And the leaves uh, um, continue to be deeply di well dissected and fern like as it matures. So this is a picture of a common ragweed leaf on the right. And you can see that it almost reminds you of a fern. Next, we're going to talk about red root pigweed. Red root pigweed or amaranthus retroflexus. It is in the amaranth family. So that's the same family that's all your pigweeds, um, your lamb's quarters are in that family. It's a summer annual broadleaf weed as well. It has a upright growth habit in its branch as well. And the leaves are alternate, um, it egg to oval shaped. It, its germination period is from late spring to early summer and the flowering period is pretty extensive and can begin as, as um, early as late June. This plant can get pretty big. So pigweed plants can flower all the way from about 10 inches tall to it can grow six and a half feet tall. So it's a pretty robust plant. Its seedlings, um, are hairy and it has pale green stems. The leaves are, um, it has lanceolate, meaning spear-shaped um, cotyledons that are red to purple on the undersides. And the leaf margins of the true leaves are green and wavy. Um, the leaves are green and the uh, margins are wavy. So as you can see, comparing ragweed on the top with red root pigweed on the bottom, you can see ragweed has these round cotyledons and these dissected leaves where Red root pigweed has these spear-shaped cotyledons in sort of egg-shaped um, leaves. It has a notch on um, the leaf tip, but which is pretty somewhat special to red root pigweed, but it is not exclusive to the species. There are about seven or more pigweed species in New York, and they look very similar to each other as seedlings, but become more distinct as they mature. And as for mature plant, they have very hairy stems. So you can see on the right, this is a red root pigweed stem versus a power amaranth stem. It, they, are, they are quite hairy. Um, it has smooth oval to diamond shaped leaves with um, wavy margin still. And the underside of the leaf is a dull green with a white mid vein. And then a good on uh, once another thing that's sort of special about red root pigweed is that its its inflorescence, which is a cluster of flowers, tends to be pretty tightly packed and stiff and grow to about two to eight inches long, as opposed to being a bit more um, open and sparse compared to Powell amaranth and some of the other pigweeds. <laughs> Moving on from there we're going to talk about common lamb's quarters. So common lamb's quarters, also called, um, also uh, Kenopodium album, is also in the amaranth family and it's another summer broadleaf weed. It is another upright plant that has, um, that is branched and it has alternate leaves that are triangular shaped. So as opposed to your pigweeds that are more diamond and oval shaped, these are more triangular. 
Its germination period is throughout the period, I mean, sorry, throughout the season. However, it peaks in spring and it typically flowers from May to October. And this plant grows from two to three feet in height, but it can also be very tall as well. I've definitely stood next to um, common lamb's quarters that were my height, if not taller. So common lamb's quarters are often confused for pigweeds and vice versa in the seedling stage. They have similar leaf shape, but there are some differences that will help you identify these, um, differentiate these two weeds. So starting, um, the pigweed cotyledon is on the left and the common um, lamb's quarters cotyledon is on the right. Um, the lamb's quarters cotyledon tend to be a bit more linear oval. So I tend to think of, a, a rectangle with rounded edges where the pigweed cotyledons tend to be a bit more spear shaped. Um, also it's leaves, common lamb's quarters leaves are more triangular and they have this sort of graininess on the surface. Uh, and that graininess is due to the presence of glandular trichomes. So basically they're little leaf hairs and sometimes they might have a red edge to it. Um, where as opposed to pigweed leaves that tend to be oval to diamond shaped and they are smooth as opposed to grainy on the surface. Here's another picture of a common um, lamb's quarters plant. Um, this is a leaf and this is uh, the, infl the inflorescence. And again, the, they are simply trichomes or little leaf hairs. Next, the next two weeds we're going to talk about are solanaceous weeds. So they are in the same family as tomatoes. They look similar to tomato plants, but they are different. So to start with that, to start, we're going to talk about hairy nightshade. So hairy nightshade or solanum um, phys, um, solifolium, it's in the tomato family, just like peppers and tomatoes. It is another so, um, summer annual broadleaf weed. It is upright and branched, and it tends to have alternate hairy leaves with sort of wavy, if not toothed margins. It germinates from mid-spring through the summer and typically flowers in mid-June to later in the summer. It grows to about one to two feet in height, but can reach three feet um, tall. And the stems and fruit of hairy nightshades um, are toxic. They are, you should not consume it when it is toxic to animals as well. Um, as you can see, the, the, these flowers look very similar to tomato flowers. So starting with this, the seedling, Hairy nightshade typically has egg-shaped to lanceolate or AKA spear-shaped cotyledons. So you can see this, this is a picture of the cotyledon up close. It has hairy leaves and stems and the young leaves are often oval with wavy or toothed leaf margins. So these are two pictures of uh, hairy nightshade leaves as opposed to the mature plant. So on the bottom right, that's a mature hairy nightshade plant. Um, it's, it continues being hairy into maturity with the uh, stems and the leaves being covered with um, sticky spreading hairs. The leaves continue to be uh, egg shaped to lanceolate and it has fine hairs on the underside of the leaf vein. Um, the leaf margins um, tend to be lightly toothed or entire, and it has five, four to five white cluster flowers per flower cluster. And the, I'm, I am saying, I am noting the flower, flower color for a reason, because that's another way that is, that is another good way to tell Terry nightshade apart from Eastern black nightshade, which I'm going to talk about next. And the, this is a picture of the berries on the left. So um, Eastern black nightshade, also called Solanum pitacanthum. It's another solanaceous weed, i.e. another 
um, weed in the tomato family. It's another summer annual broadleaf weed. It has an upright growth habit. Um, it's branched with alternate egg-shaped to triangular leaves. It germinates from mid-spring through the summer, and it typically flowers in mid-summer, about five to 10 weeks post-emergence. It will produce fruit until frost, and like hairy nightshade, it grows to about one to three feet in height. And again, it is toxic. It has toxic fruits and stems, um, and it is toxic to animals. So starting with the seedling, it has egg-shaped to lanceolate cotyledons, but you can see the cotyledons are a little bit fatter at the base. And the leaves have green upper surfaces, but the underside tends to be green to purple with very prominent veins. Um, the stems might have a red hue, but the big, a very good way to tell Hairy, um, Eastern black nightshade from hairy nightshade and also even tomatoes is it is not hairy. It has a smooth um, surface. Moving on to um, the mature plant, it continues being hairless in um, maturity. You might see a few occasional hairs, but it's nowhere near as hairy as hairy nightshade. So it has hairless stems and leaves. Um, the leaves tend to be elliptical, another word for oval to triangular, with these wavy to toothed leaf margins. The underside of the leaves continue to be red to purple. And then regarding the flowers, they tend to be in clusters of four to seven, and they, um, are, they droop and are often white to purple. So if you see purple flowers that are in drooping clusters and look like tomato flowers, there's a good chance that you're looking at Eastern black nightshade as opposed to hairy nightshade. The last weed we're going to talk about today is our sole mon monocoque. Um, it is yellow nutsedge. So that its scientific name is Cyperus esculentus. It is in the Cyperaceae family. It is a vegetative perennial monocoque that spreads by rhizomes and tubers. This, um, it tends to have a clumping growth habit that's also upright, and it has flat to V-shaped leaves. I'll have more pictures of that. The big thing that I really want to impress upon you is this is not a grass. Sedges have edges. That's a good way to remember if something's a sedge versus a grass. So that sort of V shape with that has edges, it's most likely a sedge that you're looking at. Um, its germination period is from late spring to early summer, and it typically grows to about eight to 36 inches in height. So as a seedling, it um, the shoot emerges as three glossy light, um, light green grass-like leaves. It is pretty, these are pictures of it over here. They are pretty um, light in color. So I, they almost remind me of like, if you remember Crayola crayons and they had that lime green, it's often, it's that color. It's not a very deep green. Um, the leaf blades are uh, flat to V shape and it also tends to it emerge from its sheath. That is this right here in a triangular um, shape. As you can see, the shoot base is triangular. So if you have something that's triangular like that, it's probably a sedge. Remember, sedge, sedges have edges. The mature plant um, is long and tapered, and it has sharply pointed leaves. It won't puncture you, but it can puncture black plastic in landscape fabric. As a prominent mid vein in its inflorescence or flower clusters are yellow and have this bottle brush shape, and it's a cl in clusters of spike lips. It reproduces by rhizomes and tubers. In season, it's mostly reproducing by rhizomes. That is these right here, and on the end, you see tubers. And then when mature, it produces uh, brown to black scaly uh, tubers. So those are all the weeds that we're going to talk about today. I just want to reiterate um, and further impress upon you that weed identification is key to effective weed management. By uh, understanding the biology of a weed, you are, it, you are better able to tailor your management techniques to the weeds that you have in your field. So we're talking about 
IPM today and integrated weed management is a part of IWM. But before you can go into thermal management or cultural management or mechanical management or chemical management, you should know what the weed is. The weed ID is the door to these techniques. For example, if you know that something's an annual, then you have a better idea that it will probably respond better to mechanical weeding as opposed to a perennial. Annuals tend to be controlled better by mechanical weeding than perennials do. Um, by being able to tell something's a grass versus a broadleaf, that's really good to know because if you utilize thermal weeding on your property in your, in your fields, Grasses tend not to respond as well to thermal weedings. And examples, there are more and more examples. So just if I, if anything today that you learned is know that weed ID is the doorway to other weed management techniques. So on this slide, we're almost done. Um, these are examples of further resources that will um, are could be useful for your operation. The two that I wanna highlight are weeds of the Northeast. It's a, I actually have my copy right here. Hopefully it shows up. Um, it's a really good book. It's a field guide. It doesn't really tell you anything about management, but it has keys and extensive um, list of weeds with very good pictures. They're releasing a new edition, I think later this year. And another book that I think is very useful and I used it um, both weeds of the Northeast and manage uh, weeds on your farm. This just came out um, last year. It's a really good book. Um, it not only talks about some common weeds and how to identify them, but it has sections on management techniques as well. Most of the book is on management itself. Um, I want, I put a link in um, the chat. Um, you can buy a physical copy, but it's also available online on Sayer's website for free, the PDF of it. So you don't have to uh, pay for a hard copy if you don't want to either. So that's all I'm going to talk about today. Thank you so much for your time. And uh, thank you, Veg Expo, for having me. And uh, if you have any questions, I am more than happy to answer them. So, yeah, well... Uh transition from the weeds to the insects. If it's not one thing, it's another. Um, and in, in particular, I'm going to focus this 15 minutes. Hopefully, I'll keep it within 15 minutes. I'm going to try on uh, on the stink bugs, which I think deserve a little talking time because um, I think we've got some emerging issues. So we'll, we'll get right into it. Um, but again, thanks for the invite. And um, okay, so the first thing, hopefully we're all on the same page. We kind of know what a stink bug is. Um, maybe you've got one flying around your house right now. That's, that's uh, something that some of us have grown accustomed to, but um, we kind of have a search image of what we're talking about with stink bugs, but um, there are multiple species and several of which can be pests of tomatoes. In fact, um, we put out a field guide to stink bugs that most of the ones you're gonna find in New York are in this field guide that we, we're in a second edition now. It's a little pocket-sized flip guide. Um, maybe you can get one from the Northeast IPM Center. I know they still had uh, still had some, but anyway, if you're real curious about identifying your species, um, that might be helpful. We've got a lot of brown ones, a lot of green ones. Um, not going to get into too many species uh, delineations because really the truth is most of the stink bugs are kind of similar with regard to what they do and and how you manage them. So we're just going to call them stink bugs. And what they do, um, well, what they don't do is chew holes. So if you've, you've got something attacking your crop and there's holes chewed in the leaves or there's holes bored into fruit, then that's, that's not a stink bug. Um, stink bugs have piercing sucking stylets that are in a, a pro proboscis. And, and what they do is you can see the one in the top there. Um, out one of the stylets comes some digestive enzymes that will liquefy the plant tissue. And then there's other stylets like a straw that will, that will suck it up. So all stink bugs are feeding this way. All bugs are feeding this way. And what's left behind are the, the results of that feeding, which can mark up the tomato fruit, um, as you can see on the bottom right. Um, if you've got a potting vegetable plant like edamame or something, then the seeds won't develop or they will be scarred. Um, inside of that pod. So they can do a lot of 
thing. So that's that's one thing, um, what they do, how they do it. Um, and tomatoes are definitely one of those crops that, that stink bugs will, uh, you know, it's possible that you didn't even see them out there, but you see their damage and you start seeing that maybe before you even realize that these things have, have found that crop. They'll start feeding when the, even when the fruit's green and, and developing. And then when it, it ripens, you get these ugly marks um, from where their stylets were inserted. So the other thing that's true about all the stink bugs is they kind of have a same general life cycle, which is egg masses are laid in these little tiny barrels in a, in a, in a group. And these are typically laid on the undersides of leaves. And trees are very common sites for the oviposition to occur or the egg masses. A lot of our stink bugs are, are um, tree loving insects, but as the summer progresses, they, they move into agricultural crops, including vegetables, um, where the food is, is plentiful and nutritious, and, and that's when they come in. But most of them do start their life cycle out somewhere on some trees. And um, these, when the eggs hatch, those neonates or, or first instars, they're called, um, they don't do any damage. They don't really do anything except hang out on that egg mass. Um, and they are picking up um, important endosymbionts, bacteria that are needed for them to complete their development on through the rest of their life. And the uh, mama stink bug has left those, those helpful bacteria on this egg mass and they're basically um, taking them up. And, and um, so you may see this is these little tiny things on top of this egg mass. That's the beginning of the stink bug life cycle. And then they progress through various nymphs that you know, anywhere along that line, they're, they're causing damage to uh, crops or potentially. Um, so any of these nymphs can do feeding. And then, of course, the adults continue to feed as well. The bigger they get, the more damage that they can cause. Um, so there's a, there's a look at the brown marmorated stink bug life cycle, but all the rest of the life cycles are very similar for, for all of them. And speaking of brown marmorated, um, things really changed with, uh, I talked about emerging issues, and this is you know, this is a 20 year old emerging issue, but um, when this thing entered from, from Asia, uh, it was a, you know, an accidental introduction, um, but has really taken a strong hold in the, in the Appalachian areas, particularly of, of the United States. Um, and uh, it, it really added a major, major species to the mix that just the, the, the population numbers were more than we had ever seen and the damage that this stink bug can cause was way more than we had seen before. Um, you know, here's just some pictures over the years of uh, you know, what the stink bug can, can do. And the one thing um, brown marmorated as well as most of the other ones that I showed you, the one thing they have in common too is that they are polyphagous, meaning they feed on multiple hosts and actually prefer to move about the landscape um, looking for the most nu nutritious food. And tomatoes, tomato leaves and stems aren't so much um, a desired food for stink bugs. Actually, they, they can't complete their development just on tomatoes. They're gonna end up dying. Um, but that fruit late summer is a, is a nice uh, snack for them. And, and um, that's the thing that you wanna protect the most. So, it doesn't matter whether they can do well developing on the plant, they will come and feed on that fruit, um, but likely coming from some other, some other crops. So where, where you see the most problems with stink bugs and tomatoes is farms that have a lot of different crops. Um, so organic vegetable farms, for instance, are, are perfect. And then they have a lot of surrounding trees and they're bordered by woods. And the, this is just like the perfect storm of uh, habitat for stink bugs. They, they really do extremely well in those kind of habitats. Um, so starting in 2010, we looked at, you know, how damaging have, has damage, stink bug damage increased in tomatoes is really what we looked at since the brown marmorated stink bug entered the mix. And um, so what we did is uh, over multiple years and multiple sites of insecticide trials where we test insecticides on stink bugs on tomatoes, we looked at, um, you know, what's the untreated control getting? Is it, you know, how, ma how many of the fruit are actually damaged by stink bugs? And 
this kind of gives you a picture. It's, it's, you know, over those years, about a third of the tomatoes are, are going to have stink bug injury if you don't, if you don't do something about it. And it could get much, much higher in some years. Um, and the later that you got into the season. So that's enough to say we, you know, we, we, we need to deal with this insect. So moving into management strategies and um, I've worked with this for 15 years now. And, and uh, some of my other colleagues, I know Jim Walgenbach, I think is speaking later and he, he, he's done this as well in North Carolina. There's no doubt pyrethroids, you know, synthetic pyrethroids, group three um, sodium channel modulators are probably the most effective group um, and the most Probably the, the, the one that growers are going to turn to the most because they're labeled on so many different crops and there's so many different pyrethroids. This is just a snippet, but there are many, many out there and most of them do the job really well on stink bugs. Um, so that's a, that's a starting point. If you're a conventional grower, there's probably a pyrethroid out there that is a good stink bug material. In addition to those, a completely different other group are the neonicotinoids, ones that there's regulatory reasons why some cannot use these. Um, obviously, organic growers cannot use these, uh, but they are another option for stink bug control. These are just things that we found over the years, and here are several options for neonicotinoid insecticides, all of which um, can, can get the job done. And so here's just, and I, I tell you, I could put up at least 20 different, these efficacy tables, I won't put you through that, but this is one that I just want to want you to pay attention to because the story is very similar in, in a lot of these trials. This was a tomato trial um, conducted in southwestern Virginia, where we would spray four times. Um, you know, soon as soon as you get the first fruit out there, about a quarter quarter in diameter or so, uh, that's when we start spraying and then you know continue that weekly. This is very typical. You're going to get significant reduction in stink bug damage with any of the pyrethroids, any of the neonicotinoids, and then of course products that are combos that have a little of both like you see on the bottom there, and to go to leverage. Um, that, that's really the story. I mean, you will reduce it. Are you going to get rid of all of it? Probably not. Um, there's some little windows where bugs can probably get in, um, get in, get out, do their damage, and maybe die, but they still damage some fruit. And that's where you're not getting, you know, zero uh, percent stink bug damage in some of these sprays, but you, you can significantly reduce it. And that's, that's, uh, that's the story. We, we've ranked these um, across multiple trials and, and um, you know, the bottom line is, you know, dinotefuron is one of the neonicotinoids. It seems to be um, one of the best. And you know that's labeled on on tomatoes and some other crops, and then among the neonicotinoids, I mean the pyrethroids, by by fentrin or permethrin, pythroid XL, all, all these are actually doing um, you know probably equally as well. So there's a lot of options out there, and we've tested these, and and the, you know you're going to get. So we've actually written a annual review article on this, uh, and it, it story is not changed. Story is also not changed as you change stink bug species. So it's not like there's anything that's specific to brown marmorated stink bug. These are these are true for all of them. Uh, so that's kind of it for conventional insecticides. Really, it's it's pyrethroids, it's it's neonicotinoids, and that's an entomologist who does research talking. How what do the growers say? Well, we did a survey a few years ago and of IPM consultants. Um, and you know most are saying they're getting decent control with those, and the compounds they are using are, are pyrethroids and neonicotinoids primarily. So that's that. Uh, but now let's get into a little deeper here. So you're saying pyrethroids and neonicotinoids are the answer, but um, there's something that comes with that. So the positive side, nothing's cheaper than a pyrethroid as far as insecticides go. And it can also provide control of other pests. So a couple positives there. To, the negatives are they're broad spectrum. So when you spray them, you are really creating a clean slate of insects out there where you've probably wiped out your natural enemies. Um, predatory mites, you know, the th lady beetles, things that are eating aphids, 
Um, and you know that know that when you spray that pyrethroid that you basically drop the bomb and so you could have a resurgence of things and, and no natural enemies out there. And we've seen this over and over again. Um, in fact, let's take a look at this. This is a pepper insecticide trial conducted Southwest Virginia and Blacksburg. And there's three pyrethroids by Fenthrin, Lambda Psi, and Permethrin. And yeah, we got, you know, we reduced damage over half, stink bug damage. So 64% or so um, control of stink bugs. And, you know, that's good. Your pepper didn't end up looking like the one on the bottom there, which we were getting out of the controls. But the trade-off was that we had this going on. We had, we had lady beetles and a lot of other things that were cleaning up green peach aphid on these same peppers. Um, and, and when we started spraying those pyrethroids, look at what happened to the aphid numbers. This is to the right column and they exploded. They got in the hundreds and so many aphids that um, that's what the fruit looked like. That's sooty mold growing on honeydew that had dripped off of the leaves onto the fruit from all the aphids. And, um, you know, we, we reduced stink bug damage 60%, but then we caused an aphid problem that probably hurt us economically even worse if, if you can't sell those peppers. So if, if this was a commercial grower situation. So spraying pyrethroids, although effective, it comes at a price. And, you know, that's one instance there with aphids that could flare, but depending on your crop system, you know, Western flower thrips can take off on you. Know, there are some army worms that are resistant to pyrethroids that they can flare up, um, spider mites and things. So that's, we have an answer and it may not be the best answer because um, of some problems that can happen. Another thing we looked at was, well, if you can use the neonicotinoids and, and neonicotinoids are great as soil insecticides, um, because they're systemic, they can move through the, the plant up into green tissue. Um, would that work against stink bugs? We were really curious because stink bugs kind of attack the fruit. That's not where a lot of the neonic is going to be. It's going to probably be in green tissue. Um, but we tested these, put through a chemigation system. We looked at them in peppers and, and in tomatoes. And just to see, can you reduce stink bug damage? by applying a neonicotinoid through, through chemigation. And you know this is published work um, we did in collaboration, Jim Wagenbach at NC State and my student, John Agner. Um, we did it in peppers and tomatoes. And the answer is yes. All the neonicotinoids from imidacloprid down to dinotefuron, dimethoxam, they all significantly reduced stink bug feeding on the fruit um, when applied through, through chemigation. There's peppers. And there's tomatoes. Um, so, you know, we were, we were, let me go back to that slide. We, we were actually a little curious to this. And I think what's happening is stink bugs, in addition to feeding, like they will do on the fruit, need, need to drink, they need to hydrate. And they will tap into the plant vascular system to, to get a little bit of water. It's been shown that um, stink bugs will drink from the plant. And I, and I think there, they are picking up a lot of neonicotinoids because that's where it would be concentrated and, and um, you're killing them before they can even feed on the fruit. So anyway, that's an option for some, probably not an option for all, as we have, as you all know very well, neonicotinoids are banned in various situations. I know in New York, they got your, your banning of neonics in various ways. Canada has, depending on the state you're in, the county, um, who you're selling your vegetables to, can maybe roll out neonicotinoids. So you're basically rolling out a tool that, that can be used for um, stink bugs. So what this leads to, issues with pyrethroids, issues with neonics, and those are the two things that are working well. We need, to, um, we need to find better insecticides and better ways of managing this pest is what that boiled down to. So we've been searching, uh, are there insecticides that can fit this bill and maybe not disrupt the things to the right there that we might care about. Um, one thing we looked at over the years was an insect growth regulator. And these are in products like Dimelin and Ryman. And this insecticide actually affects the insect's ability to make its, its outer shell after it molts, and then it dies. So 
you know, the insect won't be able to molt and it won't be able to make it and it's going to end up dying and you're not going to get a, a stink bug complete in its development. And we looked at these and, you know, we published a paper on this and, and yes, these products um, that are found in Demolin and, and Ryman control nymphs very well. Um, so the early nymphs and the larger nymphs, you can actually prevent them from molding. It had no effect at all on eggs and no effect at all on adults. Um, and that's where we're at with that. So you've got a material that is not going to control an adult stink bug that comes flying in from a tree and starts feeding on your tomato. So it's only gonna give you control of the nymphs once they've um, started developing on plants. So it's, it's got potential for maybe helping, um, but it's not the complete answer. We've looked at some, some other more, uh, IPM compatible um, and pollinator compatible insecticides that we thought could have some potential in stink bugs. Looked at these through the years. And I'll, I'll kind of go through these quickly here. A sale, you may be aware um, of this is a new Can you finish up in a couple minutes? Yes. Okay. Uh, sorry. Sorry. Minutes. Thanks. Okay. We'll just um let's just get into some of these, some of these materials. So the bottom line is all of those IPM friendly. Uh, insecticides are um, not as effective as the pyrethroids and neonicotinoids. That's basically what the story goes. The safer and more IP, IPM compatible, usually the less effective it is to control stink bugs. And the trial just last year that kind of showed that we've got some of these other materials in there. The best control that we got, if you look at the middle column where we got over 50% stink bug damage in the control, uh, bifenthrin and venom down on the bottom. Your neonicotinoid and your pyrethroid were the best, the, your best option. So organic growers, let me get into, uh, I will say all the things that are out there that most organic growers might use, all these oils and salts and azadiractins and pyrethrins and spinosins, they do not work. I've tested them over and over again. This trial shows it. Um, they will not control stink bugs in the field you're wasting your money. What does is kaolin, which is, you know, a, a clay-based kaolinite powder used. It, it prevents sun scald, does not interfere with photosynthesis. Stink bugs do not like it. A lot of other insects do not like it. You apply that to peppers and tomatoes, um, and you can reduce your stink bug debt. We've actually gotten as good a control with kaolin um, applied weekly as we have with, with some of our pyrethroid insecticides. The gray bars are the kaolin. The essential oils didn't work too well. As you can see, that's the orange bar. Blue is control. So the gray bar is kaolin, and we got significant reduction in stink bug injury with weekly applications of that. Organic growers can use that. And that's all I've got. Uh, I don't know if there's any time for questions, Abby, but. Yeah, um, thank you, Tom. I, I have a question, which is, um, I'm wondering when um, growers, what what growers, what factors growers should take into consideration when they're deciding when to start spraying for stink bugs. And if you stop unsharing, then I'll start sharing my screen while you're while you're answering. Thanks. So it's um. What to look for? I, I'm, I'm sorry, I missed exactly what well, it was. Like, what, how do growers decide when to start spraying for stink bugs? Do you have any um, yeah. like scouting or monitoring kinds of Yeah, you, you know, I had already had too many slides, so I pulled out um, my scouting uh, because we have looked at, there are pheromone lures that are commercially available, very, very effective at drawing in the stink bugs onto sticky cards. Um, those are effective at at least alerting you that you've got stink bug activity on your farm. Um, we've even correlated some trap catch with these with, um, you know, waiting till you get five per sticky card um, to start initiating initiate your sprays. And that, that has worked. Um, but really the bottom line is you can, you can go out and just start inspecting your plants. And, you know, if you see nothing, then you know, maybe hold off, especially hold off if you're going to be spraying pyrethroids because you could cause problems. But when you start seeing stink bugs, you've probably got enough to, uh, I know that's kind of a seat of the pants threshold, but if you see them on your plants, particularly tomatoes, 
there's a good chance they're at a level where you're going to see damage on your fruit and that you probably should start doing something about it. Okay. Well, great. Thank you so much, Tom. So I am Abby Seaman. I am the vegetable IPM coordinator with the New York State IPM program. And I'm just going to quickly talk about aphids. Tom already um, talked about some of the things I was going to talk about. So that means I can motor through a little more, bit more quickly. So just starting with um, a little bit about what, you know, what, how, how to best recognize aphids and, and some of the characteristics that we can use to um, tell one aphid from the other. Um, one of them is aphids have these cornicles and they look like little tailpipes on the, on the ends of their, on the tips of their abdomens and they can be longer or shorter and they can be um, the same color as the body or different colors from the body. So that can be a distinguishing feature. Um, and the other thing um, is just kind of a, a defining, a kind of a glossary thing is these antennal tubercles <laughs> at the base of the antennae. Um, and whether they point outwards or point inwards can be a distinguishing characteristics. Characteristics, the length of the antennae, the color of the antennae, um, sometimes the color of the legs. Um, another thing to know about uh, aphids is that as adults, there can be both winged and wingless forms. The winged ones are the ones that are going to be coming into your field from their overwintering sites. And then the, what, what we're typically dealing with on tomatoes is uh, the wingless form. Unless they get so uh, crowded that they feel like they need to start making winged aphids again. So mostly what we're going to see is the wingless form. And then just, you know, uh, Aphids have piercing sucking mouth parts. They're going to put their mouth parts in and, and um, suck up um, sap from the plant. And then they're going to um, shunt out. Tom talked about honeydew. And honeydew is a, a euphemism for um, uh, aphid excrement. Um, and, and so that's, that will drop onto the, um, the leaves or the, uh, or the fruit. And, and then that sooty mold can grow. Um, and, the, and then the antennae are typically um, held back over the, over the body. So aphids are small. And so a hand lens is going to be very important if you're going to try to identify aphids. And um, another thing to know about them is that they're relative, relatively immobile. They're not gonna move very much. They might drop off the plant if you disturb them, but um, Unlike the kind of the things that I think most look, look most like aphids, tarnished plant bug, newly hatched larvae, um, they move, the tarnished plant bugs move around a lot and the aphids really um, just kind of sit there because they've got their mouth parts embedded in the plant. So another thing to know, a more aphidology is that aphids give birth to live young. Um, so there are, you know, they're ready to come out. There's, there's no egg stage. They just give birth to, to live young and they come out and then they, um, they develop pretty quickly. There are multiple generations of aphids per growing season. Um, they develop pretty quickly from nymph to adult and populations can, and can develop pretty fast. So the, there's two aphids um, that we're likely to see on tomatoes. One is green peach aphid, um, which is pale green to pinkish in color. The cornicles are pale with a dark tip um, and the antennal tubercles uh, that doesn't really show up very well in this photo, they tend to point toward each other. These aphids have a very wide host range. You're not just gonna find them on, on tomato and they're relatively small. And um, like I said, this, they have both winged and wingless adults. And this is what the adult, the winged adult of the green peach aphid looks like. Um, the other uh, aphid that we're likely to find on tomato is uh, potato aphid. Um, this one has long antennae and long tubercles, or long, I'm sorry, long cornicles with black tips. And these, uh, the antennacle, the antennacle, antennal tubercles on this one tend to point away from each other. These guys can e be either pink or green, just like green peach aphid, but they are, they do tend to be larger than green peach aphid. And um, it can be important to distinguish between them because um, the, you'll see on the handout that Tom and other, Tom and Jim Walgenbach and other uh, entomologists in the Northeast have put together that 
Um, some insecticides don't work as well against green peach aphid as they do other aphids. And then just a, a, a photo showing you the wing form of the potato aphid. So um, severe aphid populations can call, cause leaf yellowing and blighting. Um, they, aphids can also transmit viruses um, and they can be, and because viruses can be transmitted very quickly, um, after only a little bit of feeding, um, controlling aphids is generally not a recommended practice for pre preventing virus infection. Um, as Tom said, their honeydew can cause problems. It can cause a, the leaves and the fruit to be sticky. And, um, and then also this, this black city mold can grow on the, the leaves and the fruit. So if you got aphids, the bad, moves, the bad news is that they can, uh, populations can develop very quickly. Um, high populations can cause damage, including yellowing and blighting of leaves, um, the sticky fruit, and the sooty mold. But the good news is that aphids have many natural enemies that can help keep populations under control. Um, so uh, I, I would like, so my poll was asking, do people see aphids every year or just some years? Um, how much of a problem were aphids on your farm? Um, because if, if you can help conserve the natural enemies that are out there on your farm um, by spraying only when necessary, um, avoiding insecticides that are hard, of the, uh, hard on them, like the pyrethroids that Tom mentioned, and provide pollen and nectar sources that might also provide alternative hosts for the beneficials, um, some, some years and many years you, can, um, you might not have to spray for aphids if you can keep those natural enemies working. So regular scouting for aphids is important. You wanna examine one lower and one middle compound leaf per, per plant on 25 plants. Um, you're most often gonna find aphids on the underside of the leaf. Um, you wanna record the number of aphids per leaf and calculate the average per leaf. And also look for beneficial insects as you're scouting. And I'm just gonna quickly zip through what they're gonna look like um, toward the end. And Massachusetts is recommending a threshold of six aphids per leaf which is a lot, of, it can be a lot, it can be hard to look at six aphids per leaf and, and not wanna get out there and spray. So the question you wanna ask yourself is, are you seeing any beneficials out there? Cause if you're not, um, you, if, if, you're see, if your aphid populations are building and you're really not seeing any beneficials, um, uh, that that's gonna uh, factor into your decision about whether to spray or not. And are you seeing aphids increasing from leaf, leaf, week to week? Again, that's gonna influence whether you're gonna be able to wait for that six aphid per leaf threshold. So some of the beneficials you wanna be looking for, of course, are lady beetles. Everybody's familiar with the adults, um, but not everybody knows what the larvae look like. They look like little black alligators and they often have some orange or yellow coloring on them. And also the, um, the egg masses of the lady beetles. You'll also see those where you're, where you're finding aphids. There are some parasitic wasps that attack um, aphids. And this is what the wasp looked like. She's um, checking out these aphids to see if they're suitable for her to lay her eggs in. And then her, uh, her larval larvae will develop inside the aphid. And then a, a mature, uh, um, another wasp will, will emerge from these aphid mummies, we call them. This is where the, the wasp has chewed a circular hole in the aphid mummy to emerge. So you'll find these aphid mummies um, uh, on your plants. Um, another beneficial that we often find in association with aphids is lacewings. Lacewings lay their eggs up on these stalks and then their larvae hatch and they have these really fierce mouth parts. And here's a, a, a larger um, lacewing larva with its mouth parts embedded in the aphid and it's gonna suck out the, uh, the body contents of that aphid and fling it aside and go look for another one. They're, they're really quite ferocious predators. Another one that you might see is um, the larvae of ho hoverflies. They look like maggots because they are fly larvae and they just kind of latch onto an aphid. And again, they're gonna suck out the body contents. And the adults of those are bee mimics, but they're actually flies. And you might see them um, hovering around flowers where they're looking for nectar. The, the, aphid, the adults don't do any, um, aren't predaceous, just the larvae. Um, another one is called an aphid midge, and it's a tiny little um, gnat looking insect 
um, that lays its eggs in near aphid colonies. And then you, you'll see these orange larvae. And again, they're gonna attach themselves to the aphids, suck out the body contents and move on to another one. Um, just one more um, beneficial that we can think about um, using help, help helping us control aphids in humid seasons and I apologize, I didn't realize this photo was gonna be so grainy, is there's a, there are some entomopathogenic fungi, which is just fungi that um, kill insects um, that um, can affect aphids in, in um, especially in humid seasons. So um, you wanna scout regularly for early detection, um, monitor your beneficials, um, use thresholds to let the beneficials build up as long as you can stand it up to that, thresh, that six, uh, aphid per leaf threshold, um, treat if aphid populations are building and no beneficials are present. And just another, if you're growing in a, it, it, for, for um, transplants in a greenhouse or um, plants in a high tunnel, these beneficials that I mentioned um, can also be purchased and released from insectaries. Abby, there is a question left over in the chat about kale and clay versus pyrethroids. I think that's probably for Tom. If Tom okay, is... Tom, if Tom, if you're still here, go ahead and answer sure. that in the chat. Thanks. Yeah, sure. We we um, in the, yeah. we got much better control with kaolin, um, stink bug control with kaolin than pyrethrins. Pyrethrins work great in the lab, um, but the problem is in out in the out in the environment, the sun breaks them down so darn quickly that there's just no residual, and um, it just they just no residual so then the stink bugs can just keep keep coming maybe a day after you spray um so yeah kaolin's a lot better in our trials thank you abby um so for those of you who may not be familiar with north carolina uh the main campus is of north carolina state university is in raleigh kind of in the middle of the state and i'm in the western part in the mountains near Asheville, at the mountain horticultural crops research and extension center and this is a area of the um, state where tomato production is a pretty large component of the vegetable industry. Um, I think there's probably about 3,500 acres of tomatoes in, in this, probably within about a two hour area of me. And actually there's this large field right here, which this grower produces annually. Uh, it's only about two miles from our research station. So it's, um, um, an area where there's quite a bit of tomato production and it's and it occurs annually. So um, spider mites are typically a problem throughout most of these areas. If you're not familiar with two-spotted spider mite, it's uh, it, or it feeds most commonly on leaves, um, usually on the underside of leaves, although not always. And you'll see this uh, speckling of the leaves. And uh, eventually if, if populations get really high, really high you'll see a um, early premature death of the leaves and obviously with a pre premature death there's you're going to be cutting your yields by fewer numbers of fruit um, but when populations get high they can also feed directly on the fruit and they result and you result in the um, gold flecking which you can see on the right part of the, of the screen here usually that gold flecking does not show until the fruit or turns white or until it turns red and the reason it's gold is that epidural layer on the outside has actually got a yellowish tinge to it. And they, they have sucking mouth parts similar to stink bugs and, and aphids that we just heard about. And they're feeding on those mesophilled cells right below the um, epidural layer. So they, they're, those cells are basically, they've sucked them dry and they're, it's an airspace in there essentially. So you see that yellow um, gold flecking on there. The life cycle of the two-spotted spider mite is fairly simple. They lay eggs, and then from that leg or that egg is a six-legged um, larval stage, and then you have a protonymph, deuteronymph, and adult, all of which have eight legs, as um, a class of arthropods have. And you can see the the adult here on the left side of the screen. They're about four millimeters in diameter, and then on the right you can see eggs, and uh, right down there is a is a immature or is probably a larval stage right around here. And then I'll talk a little bit later, just briefly about this yellow or this orange mite right here, which is uh, a predatory mite called Phytocilius persimilis. Uh, now, 
the the interesting thing is females that are they can they don't need to be fertilized to lay eggs but fertil all fertilized eggs are females and non-fertilized eggs are males and usually in a population uh, the majority probably about 65 to 70 percent of the population are females in most situations fewer are males well th there's a number of challenges to managing the spider mites. Um, they have a very short generation time and a high reproductive potential. So they can, obviously like all arthropods, their rate of development is directly proportional to temperature. And so the higher the temperature, the more quickly they develop. And under very warm conditions in North Carolina in the summertime, they can complete a generation in five to seven days. But those females can, uh, survive for about two weeks and they'll lay up to about 300 eggs. So you have a very fast rate of, of development. They also have limited mobility and they've, they're quite well adapted to individual or to the hosts. Um, and this, um, this the, their limited potential for dispersal really kind of impacts the potential for resistance development because there's not a lot of uh, individuals from outside of a, a tomato field that are interbreeding with these to, to help bring in susceptible uh, genes when resistance develops. But um, I won't go into that. And also on the tomato plant, there's a very low tolerance for damage, as I'll point out here in a little bit. And there is limited option, options for biological control, uh, which I'll talk a little bit about as well. The, and I guess it, in terms of its relative importance, Spider mites are, are one of the most, they're probably the second most important pest of tomatoes in North Carolina. The first being, in more recent years, being becoming more popular uh, is the Western flower thrips, but, but spider mites are a difficult one for growers to manage. Uh, our sampling system is, we, we monitor by looking at a leaflet, not a whole leaf, and we usually take that last leaflet on a, that terminal leaflet on a leaf, and it's usually, one of the first mature leaves from the top of the plant. You don't want to take the very top apical nurse in before those leaves have opened up and everything, but the first mature leaf that has uh, usually anywhere, usually has like six good leaflets on it is what we sample or we choose for sampling. And we, we will look at 10 leaflets in an area at about three to five locations per field. And that gives you a pretty good idea of, of the population level out there. Um, in terms of economic thresholds, um, this is some work that a graduate student of mine did about 10 or 12 years ago, um, Elijah Meck. So just to refresh your memory again, an economic injury level is the population density that um, causes damage. It's equivalent to the cost of preventing the population from increasing. Um, and we've shown that it's about eight to 10 mites per leaflet. If it gets above that, the damage it inflicts is oftentimes more expensive than what the, or it's, it becomes more expensive what the cost of a miticide is. Um, of course, that's going to change depending upon the miticide. Then the economic threshold level is, is um, kind of that population density um, at which control measures need to be implemented to prevent the population from exceeding the economic injury level. So it's a little bit lower. And depending upon the miticides or the cost of them, it ranges from about two to four mites per leaflet. And this was developed based upon a lag time of about four days between sampling and when control measures are implemented. So and this just shows you how, how rapidly mites can increase. Uh, this is a typical uh, popular phenology of spider mites in, in Mills River where we are. Um, you can see very low, and then but once they start to build up, it's almost a logarithmic increase or an exponential increase in population growth. Now, just to, sh to show you how low the threshold level is, this is the economic injury level. So it's it's really at the beginning stages of when this population is building, and the and that and then the economic threshold level, which I described before, is a little bit lower. This is probably about I think I have probably four mites per leaflet right here. So. It, it's early on in that population buildup when, when control measures need to be implemented. Just to give you an idea of some of the common miticides, chemical control is, is the most common approach that we, that are most of the growers in our area anyways are using. And 
these are cumulative mite days during the course of the season. So the higher the mite number or the higher the number here, the, the higher the population, the untreated control, obviously the highest. And I just wanted to point out, Tom was talking a little bit before about pyrethroids. Danitol is a pyrethroid that also has mite, mite activity. But like most pyrethroids that have mite activity, it's not the greatest miticide in the world and we really don't recommend it. And here you can see it's the only miticide that it was not significantly different from the control. What you'll actually see that doesn't show here is that it is oftentimes a resurgence of, of the population following a, a miticide application. Um, then the, the, and this is quite typical for us, this Oberon and Yalta too much, they're kind of intermediate in their activity. And year in and year out, our two best mater materials are acromite and agrimec. Uh, both of them are, they just are the best ones we see every year. Um, now we, we've done quite a bit of work looking at other materials that are more organically, have, have more of an organic approach, uh, oils, um, essential oils, um, some of these more green materials like um, uh, some of the Marone, bio, Marone ones, uh, Grandivo is one. They have some activity, but they're not nearly as effective as the regular miticides, and they almost have to be applied preventively on a weekly schedule to, to help suppress the population. Um, the other thing that is, I think is important to recognize is that weather really affects spider mite populations. You, they do very well in hot, dry conditions, and our populations are are uh, usually, or are, are, well, oftentimes are really high, or if you've got a dusty area, a road that's coming in that's uh, dusty, those mites are all, always higher on that dust, adjacent to that dusty road. Cool weather um, oftentimes uh, reduces the reproductive rate, so you have a lower rate of, of uh, population increase, and that's usually good for the, uh, for managing the population. And then rainy human conditions, there's a um, epizootic uh, Neozygides floridania. It's a fungus that can be very effective. And I just wanted to, well, just to show you the effects of some of the, the impact of weather, uh, I just want to show you how miticides perform differently in two different areas where uh, common product or tomato production areas in North Carolina, the mountains, right where I'm located, uh, our temperatures are usually about eight to 10 degrees cooler than they are in the middle of the Piedmont Center or in the middle of the Piedmont. Rowan County is one area where we do a lot of work with tomatoes. And I just wanna show you the difference of how mites respond to a miticide application. Typically with the cooler weather in, in the mountains, which is the mites population shown on the left, an application of um, biphenazate or acromite usually provides us very good control and. And because it's cooler and we have a more humid, or humid environment here, one application almost always works very well. Um, that's opposed to Rowan County where the temperatures are much higher. And we oftentimes see the resurgence of, of populations following miticide applications. So, so most of the growers in the mountains, they'll get by with one application per year quite effectively. Whereas down in the Piedmont area, it's not uncommon for two or three applications to be required to get or to keep them below a threshold level. Uh, the other thing I wanted to expand on a little bit was this uh, epizootic, or this fungal epizootic um, of Neozygites floridana. It's a very effective uh, biological control tool under wet or under humid conditions. And for instance, in the mountains, we get it's a very humid environment. And we get a fair amount of rain here. If it wasn't for fungicide applications, we would not have a miticide problem on tomatoes. But um, because it's a crop that is quite susceptible to fungal diseases, fungicides are sprayed weekly and that basically suppresses this uh, fungal epizootic. But, but very interesting, if as soon as you go outside of that tomato field where fungicides are not sprayed on a regular basis, rarely will you find spider mite populations of of high densities. Um, so, and this is something both Tom and Abby talked to, or talked about before. Pesticides can also affect mite populations uh, directly by flaring mites, pyrethroids, carbamate or seven, methamyl, novaluron, 
midocloper. Midocloper is a little bit less clear. Um, some work about 20 years ago in Washington State demonstrated that imidacloprid does flare mites. I, it's, I've not been able to do it consistently. Um, and so I really don't worry too much about neonicotinoids flaring mites that much. And then I just mentioned before briefly, um, fungicides are, are quite harmful to the um, Neozygites floridania. And um, that's essentially the reason why mites are such an important pest on a lot of vegetable crops. And as soon as you take a crop into a greenhouse also, and there's, if you've eliminated that humid environment and rain and everything, that's where mites oftentimes pop up quite effectively too. Um, I'm just gonna end here briefly on a little bit about biological control. I talked about the entomopathogen, Neozygites floridania, which is probably not a good option on, on tomatoes or cucurbits, which are sprayed frequently. Um, predators are though, the generalist predators such as lady beetles, minute pirate bugs, lacewings, et cetera, they're not that effective of uh, effective feeders on spider mites. You really need to get to those uh, predators and their other mites, phytocea mites, that are specialized and feed on, on spider mites, that are specialized on spider mites. Um, some of these kind of, I'll call them semi-generalist or Neocialis fallacious, um, Ambosius cucumeris. These can be purchased and they're quite common, uh, quite commonly released in, in greenhouse situations, um, as well as uh, strawberries, it's, it's become more common as well. Uh, one of the most effective though is a specialist, Phytocelius persimilis. This is a mite that feeds only on two-spotted spider mites. And it's, so it's, it's, it's very specialized, has a voracious appetite. It's quite mobile, so it's a very good predator if you can get it established. Um, it's native to Chile, and, it's, and, it does, and, it's, and it's, there's resident populations in the Piedmont of North Carolina, which I talked about earlier. And there we can actually see pretty good uh, biological control. Uh, it's, it doesn't overwinter as well up in the mountains here, so uh, we, we, it's not, we don't see it nearly as frequently. Um, the one thing though, these are recommended to be used at 20,000 persimilis per acre. Which, so if you've got a mite problem and you're gonna put, try and treat the whole field, it's gonna cost you about $300 per acre. That just, uh, there's the cost benefit ratio is just not there when you compare it to caricides, which is you know anywhere from $6 with agrimec up to about close to $60 per acre with, with acromite. Um, so we've kind of used a different approach where we just release these in, release phytocelius in, in the Piedmont area where we've been doing a lot of work. And if we put them very early when mites are less than, than a half a mite per leaflet, well below the threshold level, and you put them in that edge of the field where they can become, or where, where the mite populations typically become, they will follow a population across the field over a period. And in this particular field, it was about a two and a half, three week period for that phytocelius population to spread across the field. So in this situation, it worked well. It's a little bit tricky. I don't, I'm not quite sure that um, <laughs> phytocelius populations in the field are, are an approach to probably it has promise in New York where it's a little bit cooler. Um, so that's all I had to present. If, I don't know if there's any time for questions or not. Um, the, oh, I wanted to, one thing I should also point out is Tom talked about pyrethroids and uh, those growers that are trying to, or that are looking to enhance biological control, rarely do they ever use pyrethroids. It's been an educational process, but we've, we've pretty much got them off of pyrethroids and all they're doing right now for um, stink bugs are neonicotinoids, primarily venom and Actara. Um, and it's worked pretty well with them. It's, it's preserved the, some of the phytocelias. So. Uh, yeah, I was just, where you had the efficacy of the different products, I was wondering if that was after a single application or if you did a double application to get the hatch. That was uh, a single application. Usually in the mountains here, we can get by with just one application. So. If it's as long as it's timed right, <laughs> I will say that if you got a really large mite population to the point where you almost see or where you're beginning to see webbing, 
it's it's tough to get it's tough to control them even with the best of mind effects. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.